um, over the weeks now of what is called the Sermon of the Mount and Jesus' teaching of some of the best moral teaching, like I said, and the prayer that you could ever, ever get. We've gone through the Beatitudes and just getting a foundation of morality. We saw the response to that of being salt and light. And we've gone now through a series of teachings that have gone when Jesus brings us back to the Old Testament and how he has uh, not changed the law, but how it can be fulfilled. And it's actually when he said that I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then he goes in and teaching us how he fulfills it. And starting with verse 21 in chapter 5, we dealt with anger and how Jesus teaches on that. And then the lust and then also divorce and then also oaths. And we saw that last week. And it's amazing how there's a progression here with these six things from the Old Testament. One is dealing with anger, one is dealing with lust, one divorce, one oaths. Today we'll be looking at forgiveness or revenge or retaliation. And then next time we'll be looking at loving your neighbors. And it seems, it seems to follow that if there's an anger in our spirit and in our soul that will lead to a runaway thoughts and your thoughts are being controlled by the anger and lust can easily fulfill that place where God uh, once had and especially dealing with the commitment, the lust can lead to divorce and unfaithfulness, which also brings us to the point of actually keeping our oaths, but also with that, it brings us to a point of uh, learning how to forgive. And verse 38 now, this is the text we're having today. Verse 38, chapter 5 says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, have him, uh, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who who would borrow from you. And Lord, I thank you again for your word. And as we prayed earlier for the word, God, I pray your anointing upon this, this part of scripture. Jesus talks, again, a, another radical uh, thing that he says, uh, dealing with the Old Testament. And he was always being tested by the Pharisees anyway. They would always come up to him and they would test him about divorce or test him about certain things. And um, even though he's not being tested per se with the religious community, he is beating him to the punch, as it were, and bringing these things forward. And there's an there's expression, I think Gandhi said, if we lived by eye for an eye, then the whole world would be blind. And I've seen many people, especially with our ministry on the streets, that um, people to defend themselves, uh, they would bang out somebody and they would say, well, the Bible says eye for eye, so I'm gonna get him back. There's an expression that says, don't get mad, get even. And revenge is sort of um, very much a part of your thinking that uh, to, to really be, if somebody has done you wrong, then it's, it's your responsibility and it's your right to go and do something wrong to somebody else. And they use the scripture verse, and the scripture verse has been taken so out of context, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. I'm gonna go back to some Old Testament scriptures to just to give some understanding with this. Uh, the first one would be Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24 and verse 17, and which says, Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes the, an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. In other words, if you accidentally kill somebody's ox, then you would owe that person an ox, in that sense. If anyone injures his neighbor uh, as, he, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given to the person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. You shall have the same rule for the soldier as for the native, for I am the Lord your God. Uh, this also, there's a parallel passage also in Deuteronomy 19, which says the same thing. Deuteronomy 19, verse 21, uh, which says, um, Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. And going on a little later, as we're going to talk about other things of this passage, in Exodus 21, 24, it, it says here as far as uh, the same thing, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. 
Um, truly, one could even say you know, the work of a man's hand will come back to him uh, with this particular case. A lot of people think that this is sort of for revenge and it's not for revenge. It's not because somebody has injured me, then I have the right to go and injure him. This is something in our society that we have seen over and over again. And the courts still have not got it right, or they try to get it right all the time. And that is, you know, the whole issue of crime and punishment. What is the punishment that fits the crime uh, on a social level? Because this deals with the, 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 the legal aspects. When Moses wrote his writings, it's the law of Moses. It's the, it's, it was uh, part of uh, is, ancient Israel's constitution on how they would deal with injustice and how they would deal with justice, basically, and therefore injustice. So it's not so much I have this revenge that I have a right to go after somebody, but what is the proper um, punishment for somebody who has done me wrong? So if somebody comes and punches me in the face for no reason, then well, that person should be punched in the face as well. That's, that's the whole thing with the law. If somebody has, I uh, said, accidentally or purposefully kills my ox or kills my horse, which is my livelihood, if I live in an agricultural society, then I have the right to take an ox or a horse from him. Nothing more. So this is where the justice comes in. That means if somebody kills my horse and ruins my income for that sense, I cannot demand for his life to be taken. I cannot demand for him to give me two horses. I cannot demand much more than the punishment or the, the crime um, dictates. It's horse for horse or tooth for tooth, eye for eye, hand for hand, burn for burn, nothing more than that. So actually, Jesus, when, when God said that through Moses, it was a sense of justice, not revenge. And it wasn't that, okay, I have to get him back because he got me. No, is that if he has taken something from me, then I have a right to get that same thing equally, not more, equally back from him. And that's what this thing is all about. Um, when you look at it from, from our point of view right now, it says, you've heard that it was said eye for eye and tooth for tooth, um, which is the law of Moses. But I say unto you, do not resist the one who is evil. Now, this is interesting. When, what Jesus is talking about, he is not coming against the decision of judges or magistrates or the law when they say eye for eye, tooth for tooth. You know, if somebody has done something against you, you have the legal right to go and get justice for what they have done for you. Like say if somebody, um, you know, has, has, you know, stolen from you and, you know, and it's, you know, yes, you can forgive the person, but you can also go to the law and say, I want justice and I want prosecution for this particular person. It doesn't mean the person's off scot-free in, in that sense, in that legal sense. So the, 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 the decision of judges is still is intact. The law of the land is still there. Um, you know, if somebody is speeding in your neighborhood and you're very afraid of your kids going out, yes, you can say, where are the cops in the situation? This man should be arrested. It's not just forgiving everybody and just saying, forget it. No, this, that, that legal term is still there. But now what, uh, so Christ doesn't find the fault in the laws of the land or apply to judges when he gives his um, uh, execution of justice. That, that, that's not what he's, he's doing. But what he is considering now is not the legal aspects of this, but personally, how, do we, how does our heart handle this? So when something is against us, how do we handle this? Again, all of his teachings in this, he brings it back to the heart. He doesn't take away the, the legalities of it and the law and justice, because otherwise you have anarchy if you don't have the laws of the land, and, the, and there should be justice, absolutely. If somebody steals, they should be rep, uh, uh, reprimanded, they should be arrested. If somebody you know, does all the you know, embezzles or this or that, no, the law will find you out. Even something as simple as speeding, <laughs> Um, more than, more than uh, enough times I've, I've realized this, though I don't speed, but even just parking tickets or whatever, if you break the law, you have to pay it. And that's, he's not talking about this in that sense, but he's talking about now how do we deal with it ourselves on a personal level. And that's when he says, but I say to you, resist not the, ev the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him um, your left. I was really ministered to, and I, I, and I tell you, I, I've, I've seen this before, when tragedy hits families. About six months ago, there was a tragedy in South Carolina where you had this uh, racist person, or maybe it was just, uh, could have been 
racist or it could have been just anti-Christ, but he sat in a church hall in South Carolina, a young man, and he went to the prayer meeting. And after the prayer meeting, you might have heard the story, he stood up and just shot nine people. It was a white guy who shot uh, nine black people, so it could have been a racist motive, or it could have been just he hated Christians. It could have been more of a, a, a religious uh, hatred, but he just shot nine people. But he was standing in front of the magistrate. A few weeks later, they, 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 they caught the guy immediately because he didn't even run. Or if he ran, he, they caught him immediately. And he was standing before the magistrate, and the judge allowed the families to confront him, not to question him, or actually to, to make a statement. And the man was there, and he showed no emotion at all. There was no repentance. There was no remorse. He just sat there, and the judge allowed the people to come and, and speak. And they're all Christians, and they just said, you know, you have caused so much hurt in my life. You've taken away. You've ruined our lives. And, and all nine families were able to speak that. And, but I will forgive you. I forgive you. And the guy was asking for forgiveness. He showed no remorse and he even showed nothing when they were saying that we actually forgive you. But in their heart, and even though I'm sure they would want full justice for this, for this young man, you know, put him away for life or whatever. He just killed six people, or nine people in cold blood. So it wasn't take away the law. It wasn't, you know, take away the eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life thing. But how does it deal with our individual hearts? And that's what Jesus deals with right now. Now, do I carry that grudge with me? Do I uh, come and say, I would not forgive you ever? And, the, you know, this is really hard. Um, when you look at a Christian walk, and this is something that has been spoken about and written about from hundreds of years and ages past, but what is one of the hardest things in our Christian walk to do? And it is the act of forgiveness. It's very hard. Uh, when, when people have done great injustice against you, have hurt you, maybe even maimed you, or taken away things from you, stolen from you, that things that cannot be replaced, and have just ruined things, ruined your reputation, have done wicked things against you. We are commanded, not just we are encouraged to, we are commanded to forgive. And this is where, even though you, you may want the extent of the law to that person, that's what this is talking about, I want the full extent of the law to this person, but in my heart, Lord, I, I need to forgive this particular person. Um, I mean, look at Romans quickly, Romans chapter 12, and then look at some of these things uh, with dealing with the law and dealing with um, our own heart. And sometimes they, they, they do not coincide. Well, they, they, they coincide as far as we obey the law, but, you know, I may not want the, I mean, in fact, I don't want society to, to, the law to forgive them. I want justice, but in my own heart. I mean, 12, 17, chapter 12, verse 17 in Romans. And it just says, hey, you know, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I mean, this is amazing. So it's, again, you still want justice. You still want to be, you know, you still want God to, to, um, to show the vengeance on this particular person, but that is not left up to me. And then it goes on, to the contrary, look at verse 20, again, Romans 12. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. By doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Uh, do, not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Even with this thing about, about your enemy, I mean, it shows that, you know, even Christians would have enemies. People do, do have enemies. People who uh, di diametrically oppose you. And even if you're in a time of war, um, you know, it doesn't mean that you just let the prisoner go and he's, if he's, you know, somebody who's, you know, against your country and killing your soldiers or whatever, you don't let him go. He's a prisoner of war, but you treat him kindly. So you, you understand, let, let the law take its place. He's now prison. He's a POW. He's there. He, he's your enemy. But you also treat him kindly and don't, just because he's your enemy, you don't um, treat him badly. And the general principle that Jesus was laying down is that we are not to resist uh, evil. You know, do not set yourself against the evil person who is injuring us. 
a huge thing with this, dealing with that issue, is that we war not against flesh and blood, but against principality and powers. Now, when I deal with a particular person who's insulted me or has done harm against me, my main thought, I, we dealt with this, we're dealing with anger. You have two choices, to react to the situation, or in this case, the person, or to uh, respond to the word of God. Now, I can still be angry with somebody, I can still want justice for somebody and be, and be justified with that, but in my own heart, I have to say, God, check my motives. It's interesting, go over to Psalm 91, and this is David dealt with the same issue wonderfully, I think, as well. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Uh, I'm sorry, no, it's, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And David said in Psalm 31, All that you would slay the wicked, O God, O men of blood, depart from me. Now David was a warrior. David was also a king. He, he was one to legislate justice. He was a king and he had laws that he had to uphold, civil laws, as well as godly laws. Now at the time he was living in a sort of it was a monarchy, but it was also a theocracy in some aspects because their law was the law of Moses. But he had laws of the kingdom, a physical kingdom. And he was also a warrior and a soldier. He says, O God, that you would slay the wicked. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. He's talking to God, and your enemies, God, are my enemies. But watch this, verse 21. This is so important. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Now that is powerful. That's a, a strong, strong language. Do I not, this is David who's called the man of the God's own heart. Do I not hate those who hate you, O God? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I, and watch this, I hate them with a complete hatred. I count them my enemies. That is strong, strong language. And this is something that we, you know, we may have the passion within us when we see such injustice, when injustice is against us. When an evil person comes against us and, and does evil things against us and say, God, where are you? Take this man away. Take this woman away. You know, do, do to them what they've done to others and, and you just absolutely despise them in that sense or despise their action. But David says that in verse 23, this is the attitude. Immediately he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. Let me, not be, be, let me not be manipulated by my own passions, God. Let me not be manipulated by my own selfish desires, God. I want your desires. And I would hate the things that you hate, God. And I will embrace the things that you embrace. You lead me in the way everlasting. So even though I hate them with a the perfect hatred, and immediately he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. That's that reacting versus responding. If I just react to the situation and I just want it immediately the reaction, that's verses 21 and 22. No, I hate, I hate this evil. I hate the people who are doing it. I hate that stuff. I hate those that hate you, O oh God. But the responding to God is verse 23. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. So when it says in Going back to Matthew 5, it says, you know, uh, you've heard they have said eye for eye and tooth for tooth. I say, yes, God, bring the vengeance. Yes, God, bring what, is, what should happen to these people who have done such an evil thing. But also, Lord, when it says, he goes on to say, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone who would sue you and to take your tunic, let him take your cloak as well. You know, when we leave room for the, the wrath of God, um, and we should, again, I thank God for the laws of this land all the time. Just going back, one thing I wanted to hit, that I forgot to mention, go back to the Romans passage in Romans 12, or go to Romans 13, rather. Romans 13, and to, this is why we have to sub subject ourselves to the ruling authorities. We're not anarchists. We don't want just... You know, God we just wants to slay people that we, we just disagree with or have been evil people, whatever, in that sense. Every person, verse 1, chapter 13, every person should be subject to the governing authorities. 
For there is no authority except from God, and those that have existed have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you, you will receive his approval. Here's the point. For he is God's servant for your, for your good. Uh, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And the way that God does it many times, yes, if somebody commits uh, a murder in this country right now, he will, spend, he will spend the rest of his years, at least on paper. Again, we, we, we wrestle with this idea of crime and punishment all the time. You know, we want the punishment to fit the crime. And sometimes we feel it's not up. You know, somebody commits a murder and they end up serving three or four years. We say, this is not right. And maybe it's not right. I'm not here to talk about that issues of the law. But the government has the right to, to yield um, to, to, to exercise a judgment that will fit the crime. And I know certainly in, in other countries that um, if you, like say, commit a murder, you spend the rest of your life in, in jail. Some even have a, a death sentence that goes with it if you commit a murder. Uh, again, I'm not here to talk about the death penalty, but that this is what is um, in play here, that when you say, you know, not resist an evil person and um, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other, that anything goes, no. Let the, let the law of the land be God's wrath against that person. And that's what's saying, leave room for the wrath of God. And so like going back to the South Carolina case, uh, it wasn't up to those people, if they're standing before the judge, to go and act against that person. Let the judge do it, and hopefully the laws are just, and this person will be pro prosecuted properly and serve the time that he should be serving. Matter of fact, I think just in my own, if I recall, South Carolina may even have the death penalty. He may be facing that. I don't know. In the states, it's, they do still, some states still, still have that, but at least he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. But that's, that's the agent of God on that person. So God will bring vengeance to that person. It's not up to the nine, even though their lives have been shattered, ruined. He's caused so much pain. Again, search me, O oh God, know my heart. Though I, I want justice for this man, Lord, I pray that there be proper justice for this man. It's interesting, too, because just because we, so, that we have this doesn't mean that we can't question the evil or the bad things against us. And this is a wonderful uh, case. I mean, go, go to John 18 for a second. John 18, verse 23, when it says, if somebody slaps you on the face, give him the other cheek. Well, this is an interesting thing that has always um, intrigued me. In John chapter 18, verse 23, when Jesus is being questioned, um, <clears throat> verse 22, put it this way. John 18, verse 22, and Jesus responds to the high priest, something they didn't like to hear. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand. Is this, is this how you answer the high priest? Now, Jesus didn't just turn his head around and have him slap the other one. He was slapped in the face. But what he said, he said, Jesus answered him and said, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And that always challenges me. If there's an evil against me, and yes, I can, for, I can um, forego the actual, matter of fact, I'm commanded to forego the actual striking back at that person, but that does not stop me from questioning this person. And I love that when Jesus said, because he did not just say, well, you just slap me in this cheek here, won't you hit this one as well? No. He was slapped and said, why do you hit me? You know, if somebody does evil against you or does something against you, you certainly have the right to say to that person, um, you know, why and what's going on. So just to sum up, this part of, of this particular um, section of this, of, of this passage, you know, we are to allow the law of the land to take full advantage of the evil that is done towards us and maybe towards others and to... And to, and, and, and to fight for that. I mean, I, I've said over and over again, democracy is not perfect, but probably if you look at the governments around the world, it's probably the best thing that we have for a human government. With that, 
Um, again, there is injustice around, and that should infuriate us. But we also should pray, being Christians, to pray that justice be done, that those who do break the law uh, will be prosecuted, especially if those who do things against us, they will be caught out and found. Um, and that is proper to do. What's interesting, too, when it says here, when um, verse 40, if anyone would sue you, you know, take your tunic, let him have it, have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go to him two miles. Um, we've learned in other parts of Scripture verse, if somebody wants to bring you to court, try to settle with him out of court. Be as peaceable as you possibly can. Um, if he comes to you and wants to take, you know, even more stuff, again, it is the reaction versus the response. Respond to God. Life is more than just the material things. Um, you know, it's the issue of, you know, if, if we're going to take my car, you're going to sue me for all this other stuff. Find out what it's about. Try to work that out with him. But do not get overwhelmed with material possessions as well. Let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go to him too. Now, this is very interesting. This was, goes back to a Persian law, and also Rome took it up as well. Uh, in Persia, they had an incredible postal uh, system, and they would have these certain outposts, and the person would go on horseback, it's almost like in the old American Pony Express type thing, but this goes back hundreds of years even before Christ, they would go, and if the person got tired, they could actually commission somebody or um, uh, consign somebody there and then and force him to go a mile to carry this letter. In Rome as well, under Rome, a Roman soldier could commission anyone at that time and force him to walk a mile. We see this with Simon of Syria when Jesus dropped his cross. They immediately took somebody out from the crowd and forced him to carry this cross, and by law, you had to go a mile with him. So even under constraint, being forced to do something, Jesus says, if somebody forces you to go that one mile, go with him a second mile. And so that, that's the whole thing about, it. and the whole compelling to go with him, and not only doing what is required of you, but do more. Even if it's unjust, even if you think that is not right, uh, do more. And basically the whole thing is to give, and look at the last thing, give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who borrowed from you. Um, again, there's a lot in here talking about the retaliation and forgiveness, and then also being free from the material things. Um, still wanting justice, but still being free from, don't let things just grab hold of you. Also, in the verse 40, um, 41, forces you to go the one mile, go within the two miles, even though you feel I shouldn't even go the one mile with him, like Simon of Serene, I'm not sure if he was pleased, he was picked out of the crowd, forced to go the one mile, carry the cross of Christ. Well, if he had heard this teaching, he'd be willing to go two miles. And the last thing, too, is to give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who borrows. You know, this whole thing about you know, give to the one who, who begs from you, I mean, when you, when you look at the humility that this involves, you know, but for Christ, so go we. You know, I spent most, much of my adult life working with the, the urban poor, and I see people who ask and ask. As a missionary, I go to countries that are uh, receiving nations continually, third world countries. Um, and matter of fact, I'm on, I'm on communications right now with other missionaries, and it's just a matter of time when they want to partner with the ministry, they want to be part of the work. Oh, I see your Facebook, I see your website, can we partner together? Make it down. Within a day or so, oh, by the way, can you help our ministry now? We have so many orphans, we have so many of this. Can you start giving to our ministry after, which was, I believe, the main motive initially, and the whole thing about partnering with us is, you know, to, to get that. So how do we handle this with so many, so much needs around us and so many people saying, please, can I have this, can I have that? Please give me, give me, give me. And says, give to the one who begs from you and not refuse the one um, uh, that uh, refuse and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. The whole thing builds on with a gentleness and a humility with Christ. You know, when you look at 
You know, there's so many people asking for Jesus in his day. But we know that he did not heal every single person. That's proven. Uh, after the Holy Spirit fell, the, um, the disciples are still in Jerusalem. And he was in Jerusalem. He was healing all those in the temple and healing all those around him. And yet, the first miracle of the early church was healing a man who was blind, who was sitting by the temple, and Christ was in the temple every single day. So obviously that, that person wasn't healed. So the, the, you know, to, to have the idea that every single person, on, like say on the street, in my own ministry, I have to give out, I would have nothing to give after a while. You have to understand there's a long suffering, there is a humility involved in here. And, um, but strife is forbidden. I don't give out of compulsion, and then there's no reward in that, and there's, no, there's no glory in that. There's, um, you don't give under compulsion. Matter of fact, when it looks upon giving, there are laws about that, that we should actually set aside what we have purposed to the Lord. This talks about even tithing or giving to the Lord, but also giving in life to set aside those things that I am going to, to give to the Lord. When you look upon gentleness, of course, you look upon, well, example of Jesus who gave and gave and gave, and even Jesus would give as much as he possibly could. Even his own life he gave up to, and those are the three years that he was here. 1 Corinthians 6, 6 just says, In purity and knowledge and patience and in kindness in the Holy Spirit and genuine love to give. That goes even, friends, when you go the extra mile for somebody. That's where that expression comes from, going the extra mile. It comes from this sermon of the mount. And if somebody asks you to do something, go the extra mile with him. But do it in purity, in, in, in knowledge of God, in patience and kindness. Do it in the Holy Spirit. So if somebody would, would beg from you, if it's not in your heart, I mean, meet the need. Yeah, I, I have to say do that. But also do it with a joyful heart. God loves a joyful giver. If you can't do it with joy, friends, then maybe refrain from giving at the time. Seek your heart. You know, seek, ask God, what is, you know, why? Is this something stopping me right now? You don't want me to give this at this particular time? Or am I just being selfish or whatever? Let me know, God, and, and to give it. When it comes with giving, I mean, go back, we went to that Romans passage, go back to Romans 12 as I kind of wind down here with a few scripture verses. God will show you what to give. God will show you who to give. Um, you know, just realistically, uh, we, we cannot give what we do not have. Romans 12, 8, just says right here, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, talking about the gifts that people have, to one who contributes in generosity, you know, the one who does acts of mercy in cheerfulness. So whatever you do, do it as, as of a, unto the Lord, do it with generosity, do it with cheerfulness. If it cannot be done in that way, friends, then search your heart, then the one who asks and the one who begs. And just four scripture verses quickly, and then we're gonna just close in prayer with this in Proverbs 12, eight. Proverbs 12, 8, it says, A man is condemned according to his good sense. Um, see, but, but one of twisted mind is despised. I'm sorry, 25, wrong one. Proverbs 25, 21. Uh, forget the Proverbs 12. Proverbs 25, 21. And Jesus quotes this anyway. If your enemy is hungry, feed him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Friends, that even goes beyond wartime if the enemy, if you have somebody, something against somebody and one who's been just a thorn in your side for many, many years, but if they're in trouble, uh, I tell you, this is one way to break maybe years of animosity toward, towards somebody, an act of kindness. After fasting, Isaiah 58, 7 said, is it not to divide, this is talking about the fast the Lord loves, is it not to divide your bread with hunger, with the hungry? to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and do not hide yourself from your own flesh. That's Isaiah 58, 7. Psalms 37, 21 says, the wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. And just to close here in Psalm 112, verse 5, it is well with a man who is, who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause in judgment. So we see these, these principles that Jesus is gleaning from when he says that, you know, give to the one who begs from you. 
Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. The, the antithesis of this, of course, we see this in, in just English literature. In Dickens' story, The Christmas Carol, you have the uh, Scrooge, who will not give to anybody. And we see the absolute decay of his life and the loneliness of his life. Being generous opens heaven for us. Being generous opens the floodgate of heaven for greater things in God for us. There's an example that if, if you have your hands, and those of you listening to this on, over the web and cannot see me, but if you throw your hands open, your hands are open to give, it means your hands are open then to receive from God. And the more you receive from God, the more you give out again. And your hands are open, and then your hands are open to receive what God has to give you. If your hands are closed and you're holding on to what you have and you can never keep it, you cannot receive anything from God because your hands are closed. You open your hands, you, you give out what God has given to you, and then God fills you again. And you give out again, and God fills it again. And you can never outgive God. So when, you, when, you, when those who are begging from you, give. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so we're we'll close in prayer. And that, and be encouraged with this, with the giving, and the patience, the long-suffering, with the forgiveness and understanding that vengeance is God, and God will repay all those who do bad, break the law, do evil against you. I tell you, just one more thing before, one thing I didn't cover with that vengeance, and if, you know, God is not also saying here, Christ is not also saying that if somebody's doing evil to your family, like say if there's a threat against your family, you do have the right to protect yourself. This is a question we bring up all the time in our Bible school when dealing with ethics about how, what's the use of violence a Christian can use. Well, I'm not getting into a whole teaching on that now, but that certainly doesn't mean that if somebody's doing evil to you, well, you just let, you know, and... Just them go and do it. There are some groups who believe that. There are some groups in the states, whole communities that will not lift a finger, even if, say, the wife is the wife is being raped or the child is being abused or beaten. They will not intervene and stop an evil person from doing it. They will not resist an evil person. That's not what this scripture is talking about. I believe that. I believe you have the right to protect your family. You have a right to protect yourself, obviously. Um, so when it says, do not. You know, resist an evil person. That is not to say that uh, you're not allowed to protect yourself. Um, Christ is not saying that at all. So let's pray and just um, thank the Lord for his word with us and the understanding of certainly eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It does not signify revenge, as most people say. It is dealing with the issue of crime and punishment. Let the punishment fit the crime. And if, you do, if, if you've done the, the crime, let the punishment, that you, then receive the punishment that would be deserving of you and no more. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much, Lord God, for um, this teaching, God, of, from Christ's words of eye for eye and tooth for tooth. And Lord, let's, and thank you for allowing us to understand, God, that it is not talking about vengeance, as most people take it as as an excuse to hit back. But it is a trust in God that whatever uh, the work of a man's hand will come back to him in like manner. Father, thank you for the laws of this land. I do realize there are laws around the world, Father, that are overbearing and the governments are overbearing and the laws do not match the crime. Some are suffering greatly, Lord God, for things that, that they should not be suffering in that capacity with because of the unjust governments. But he's not talking about that either, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that um, just the, the balance that you have, that you will revenge, God. I do pray for justice in our society, justice in our lives. But, Father, may we have a perfect heart towards you, as David said. Have a perfect hatred, Father, of the things that you hate. And, Father, may we say, search me, O God, and find out if there's any anxious thoughts in me, Lord God. Purify my heart that I may... Um, understand fully, Lord God, and with purity the way that I should act and react to situations and injustices in my life. Jesus, thank you.
for this teaching and for this time right now. In your mighty name, amen.